Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you guys for coming, especially for braving such a, such a, a warm and festive uh, winter evening. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, I would like to uh, welcome you guys. Uh, my name is Nathan Fox. Uh, I'm the chair of the MFA Visual Narrative Program uh, here at SVA. Uh, it's a low residency uh, graduate program in visual storytelling uh, that places emphasis on both creative writing uh, and visual art equally. Uh, and uh, it is my supreme pleasure uh, to have you guys here, uh, especially this evening with our artists in residence, as this is our kind of inaugural year in total. We launched, uh, Pan and I launched the uh, Rezo Lab uh, just a bit over a year ago. Uh, our artists in residence, this is our first launch uh, of this, and I'm, I'm really proud to uh, have them here and be able to continue this program. So thank you guys very much. Um, the, the program that I run is based in storytelling. So self-publishing and original content is massive. Uh, so for us to be able to provide, offer, and even just generate uh, the Rezo Lab uh, that drew these artists and others to it to begin with is phenomenal. Uh, and I, I couldn't have done that uh, without Pan. And uh, we ended up meeting uh, again about a, about a year ago uh, and uh, really got together and tried to push to bring something unique that the school didn't have that would really emphasize uh, that, that sense of agency, authorship, uh, and publishing. Uh, and Pan, uh, as you guys will meet in a second, uh, Paniotis Terzis is an amazing printmaker, uh, easily a master uh, Rizzo Smith, uh, and an artist in his own right. Um, so without further de delay, I'd like to introduce uh, Pan Terzis. Thanks, Nathan. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. We have a few uh, slides, um, you know, uh, just uh, sort of, um, you know, giving a brief nod to the visual narrative program, which is, uh, which as uh, Nathan um, just mentioned, is a really groundbreaking breaking program. Um, combining visual storytelling and various mediums, artists, uh, and creators from all different uh, backgrounds. And uh, so, you know, Rizograph printing um, is kind of what's brought us together tonight. About a year ago, you know, to see kind of where we've, we've come is, is pretty amazing. Um, we're reaching the end of our fourth semester at the Rizo Lab, and I have to say I'm humbled, but I'm not surprised by how far the space has come in just a little over a year. We started out with 20, 20, 20 students spread across two courses, both taught by me, and one employee, also me, in the fall of uh, 2015. And since then, we've grown to a student population of 72 students enrolled in three continuing ed courses and one undergrad course, having added two faculty members, uh, Paul John, PJ, and Patrick Crody, in addition to myself. Um, very, very briefly, I just want to go over Rezograph, the Rezograph printing process which you guys are still gonna be completely confused about, um, even after my description and potentially after, uh, after tonight, um, you know, it'll clear up a little bit. But essentially, Rezograph printers, um, they're unique printing machines that print individual color layers via stencils that are automatically applied to color cylinders. The process works like an automated, automated screen printing machine crossed with a copier and an offset printer. Um, they're traditionally marketed to, to offices, churches, restaurants, and schools. So, um, but in the past decade or so, artists have kind of discovered them and put them to use in all kinds of print and publishing experiments. Um, this is a phenomenon that's occurred parallel to the massive rebirth of self-publishing and zine culture, which, uh, which is sort of uh, a, a response to, but also um, connected to all kinds of um, subcultures uh, sort of exploding out of the internet and all kinds of different people finding each other. So these are two parallel um, phenomenons that have happened. This has created, created a space where uh, artists and photographers, creative people from all kinds of different backgrounds, designers, um, converge and, and share ideas uh, in various print, uh, print projects. Um, at the lab, essentially, we're dedicated to providing an inter interdisciplinary space for printing, publishing, and production of rhizograph-based printed works. Our mission is to become a hub of small-scale and experimental printing um, and publishing activity that brings together artists of all backgrounds and disciplines to encourage dialogue across different creative worlds 
and foster discussion about the role of print media as a vehicle for art and culture and as a way to work out creative ideas that lead to unexpected results that would not be possible without the sole reliance on today's digital tools. Um, so here you see there's a few scenes. This is one of our other current artists in residence, Greg Foley, with a workshop that he recently, le recently led where we opened up our space to the public um, to come in and, and sort of test out these machines. As you can see, um, that's the Rezo. Um, you know, they look like just traditional copy machines, um, but they're really these kind of amazing, incredible machines um, that sort of force, uh, you know, force the artists to really get involved in the, in, the, in the process. And we've done all kinds of collaborations with different departments, including um, the Department of uh, the International Studies Program. So this is a workshop that we led over the summer with a group of students from China, uh, Korea, and a few students from Japan. Um, so at the end of the spring semester of 2016, we added our artist in residence program to um, you know, our growing list of collaborations with other departments and all kinds of endeavors um, as a chance to open up the lab for individuals with a unique vision to come into the space, learn the process, and develop a print-based project incorporating Rezo printing and elements of self-publishing. And tonight you're going to get a chance to hear from three of our artists in residence, um, Fawn Krieger, uh, Harvey Redding, and uh, Tu Tran. Um, I also want to mention that we have an event that we've been, um, we've been running every semester at the end of, at the conclusion of the semester where uh, we give our students a chance to uh, sell the work that they've made, um, exhibit it, um, you know, trade. Uh, so we're gonna have the, our fourth uh, semi-annual print slam on, on Monday, and uh, this Monday it's going to be from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Um, so, you know, if, if, uh, if anyone wants to come out and see in person some of the work that's been, that's been made this semester in the lab, um, uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to have you there. Um, additionally, we'll be having an, an information session on January uh, 11th, uh, that's a Wednesday, um, where you'll be able to get a chance to come out and hear from all of us individually. Um, the three, four faculty members uh, from the Rizzo Lab, and also you'll, you'll get to test out the machines and kind of see what it's all about. Um, so before we start tonight, I want to leave you with a few, just a few ideas to think about that, that I think are really, uh, the two kind of themes that are closely connected to, uh, to sort of using risograph printing to, to, create, uh, to create artworks and publications. Um, this process requires you to become deeply involved in the process by separating colors and controlling the speed, pressure, and the, pos and the position of the drums um, during print runs, uh, connecting, which connects this process with the history of artists using technology um, to make all kinds of new, new, new uh, sort of uh, kinds of work, different sort of artworks. Um, so what we're doing, essentially, uh, by taking these machines that weren't designed um, to, to create you know, multi-layer prints, um, you know, we're joining the tradition of, of artists such as Robert Rauschenberg, Gretchen Bender, um, uh, Nam, Nam June Paik, uh, who have taken technology and sort of used that to change their work and change the process and ultimately change the message um, of the work that they're creating. It's the, this, the collaboration between man and machine, which is something that I, th I don't think you can separate when you work with a machine, a technology like Rezo. The other theme that I want you guys to think about as you, as you, uh, as you see what our artists and residents have, have come up with during their time here is um, that risograph printing taps into the possibilities that printing technologies have always provided, the power to develop and express a unique point of view and to spread a message, spread that message throughout society. Um, this kind of activity is healthy, is crucial for a healthy civil society to flourish in a democracy and it's I think it's more important than ever as our core democratic values come increasingly under threat. Um, so here at the Rizzo Lab, we're committed to absolute freedom of expression and providing a space for aesthetic, technological, and conceptual experiments in art and print. Um, so I'm going to introduce our first artist in residence, Fawn Krieger, who uh, Fawn Krieger is a New York-based artist whose multi-genre works examine themes of touch, ownership, and exchange. 
She received her BFA from Parsons School of Design and her MFA from Bard College's Milton Avery Graduate School of the Arts. Uh, her work has been exhibited at the Kitchen, Art in General, Nice and Fit Gallery, the Moore Space, Von Lintel Gallery, the Rose Art Museum at, at Brandeis University, and many, many more. Um, it's been, she's been featured in New York Times, uh, Art Forum, Art in America, Sculpture Magazine, New York Arts, Flash Arts, and Text zur Kunst. Um, Fonz received numerous grants, including those from Art Matters Foundation, John Anson Kittredge Educational Fund, and the Jerome Foundation. She serves as a grant officer and, and educational um, uh, director at the Keith, Faring, uh, Keith Herring Foundation. Her current project, a line of experimental workwear she designs and fabricates herself called Outfit, is presented in the form of a mail order economy, um, the first catalog of which she produced through her residency at SVA's Rizzo Lab. And she was also the first, our very first artist in residence. I worked very closely with her with many, many, many sessions to help her um, produce uh, her beautiful catalog of, of her work documenting her project, which she's about to show you. Um, which led to all kinds of interesting discussions about art and technology, about politics, um, about many, many themes that I'm sure she's about to um, delve into. So um, enough from me. Uh, I want to introduce our first artist in residence, Fawn Krieger. Thanks, Pam. Um, I just, uh, before I begin, I just want to thank Nathan and Joan. Um, where is Joan? Oh, here you are. Um, and Pan, um, and especially Pan, as, as you noted, uh, um, I really learned a lot working with you, and um, I didn't come into this process as an illustrator or designer. Um, I'm really more of a sculptor. So uh, there was a really big learning curve for me, and I appreciate so much the opportunity to be, um, to receive uh, this fellowship because I actually learned a new skill um, in addition to producing uh, a project I'm really proud of. Um, okay, so. Um, so uh, to start off with, um, this sort of uh, anchors uh, where I'm coming from with the project that I worked on in the Rizzo Lab. Um, I want to talk about this term called soft power. Um, this photo uh, shows Nixon in a conversation with Khrushchev. Uh, it's from 1959 at um, what was sort of the equivalent of a, of a Cold War World's Fair. Um, there were a series of, of conventions um, in the late 50s uh, that um, were held in Moscow, East Berlin, New York City that promoted um, a cross-cultural dialogue between Soviet uh, and East German countries and American capitalism. Um, so in this photo, what you see is uh, took place in Moscow in an entirely uh, recreated model American home replete with a method acting American family who used um, all of the state-of-the-art American um, domestic appliances. Uh, the idea of it was to, prov uh, to promote the, the advances of, of capitalist um, uh, technology. Um, and it's where this idea of soft power was born. Um, it is essentially uh, defined as um, propaganda of stuff. It's, it's mild persuasion of ideologies through things, the things that we live with, primarily domestic goods. Um, and in this project, I've been thinking a lot about how um, our role of consumers enters the home and how the home becomes a kind of battleground. So, of course, I'm thinking about where we are now in relation to um, our role as consumers, how we access information, how much we're accountable um, to what corporations provide us, what it says about our ideologies, um, what those corporations want us to think. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're in sort of a soft power moment again. Um, and uh, I, I think 
initially when I started thinking about this project a, a couple of years ago, I was thinking about um, the clothes I wear and how they are in essence the first thing that touches my body in the world. And um, I started to think about all of the in inequitable conditions um, that go into the fabrication of my apparel. Um, you know, child labor, inequitable pay, sometimes slavery, nationalistic ideals, corporate profiteering. Um, and I just thought how ironic it was that I'm putting these ideals right on top of my body. Um, and how, and I started to ask myself, like, how I could begin to bring my ideals to the outside um, and, and start to reinforce them in the things that contained my body. Um, so originally I thought, I'm gonna make a line of clothing for myself, which subsequently evolved into um, a mail order economy. Um, and in the Rizzo Lab residency, I um, printed designed and printed a functional mail order catalog. I did an edition of, sorry, I'm so nervous. I did an edition of 250, and um, I maybe have about 40 left, so I've been sending them out. Um, should I read this? It says, Outfit is a mail order catalog by Fawn Krieger containing experimental, modular, and practical workwear situated somewhere between theater and sculpture, a wearable stage. It is informed in part by Cold War soft power consumerism, propagandistic merchandise in the form of domestic luxury goods, implemented as a medium of protest. Outfits are designed for working bodies moving through urban spaces from morning through night and are made from pre-washed high quality cotton canvas duck. How do we live in our things in ways that support our labor and movement? So, even before I got this opportunity, I envisioned this mail order catalog as being printed in the risograph method. That was my fantasy for it. And one, the sort of primary reason why was because I wanted to print photographs, but I wanted them to be somewhat obscured and sort of a hybrid between illustration and photography. My desire was that it would demand of a recipient of the catalog to really take a risk in trusting the media to potentially reach out and try to buy one. Um, and I'm sort of interested in that threshold moment when we become consumers and sort of slowing that down. These are just some pages. There's um, like a little tear out order form Um, the clothing emphasizes movement, practicality, labor, and androgyny. So uh, I titled the project, obviously, Outfit. Um, in designing the logo, I was thinking about letters that sort of become subjects or, or people, almost like ancient runes, and, and thinking about sort of like how to express something gigantic through language. Um, so the, the term outfit came out of, of course, wearing an outfit, but, um, so, but it also came out of thinking about um, not just physical movement in an outfit, but also social movement and the idea of like kind of an outfit as a team or um, a group or a community. So um, this, this project, I'm gonna sort of bring up a few other things that I've been working on or that connect to this project, previous work. Um, for just about 10 years, I have been uh, researching this phenomenon of um, rubble mountains around Germany. They uh, were built out of the architectural wreckage of World War II. <coughs> and um, what you see on the left with that architectural structure in the background is one of the largest rubble mountains in Berlin, in, in Germany, it's located in Berlin, and um, that is an, a former espionage tower for West Germany on the top of the mountain, placed there, of course, because it was the highest point in the city. 
um, just some variations on other Rebel Mountains. This is um, in Stuttgart, and it's uh, an open air church at the top of a Rebel Mountain. And for contrast, this is a uh, on the left a Rebel Mountain on the outskirts of Dresden, and just put this in and just in in terms of showing you sort of the vast differences in how um, how how the mountains sort of inhabit both uh, geographical slash physical space as well as sort of psychological pockets and social pockets within um, the culture. Through this um, research, I've also been uh, interviewing former rubble women um, who cleaned up the rubble. Uh, it was a primarily female manual labor force. Um, so I've been sort of the impetus for the work was uh, in looking at what happens when women build. But this project has like really, it's research and it's really sort of in, inspired a lot of other work of mine sort of quietly. Um, one way is, for example, that it was the beginning of when I started to look at the work dress um, and w what women wear to work in. Um, but also it meant going to Germany a lot. And um, on one of my early trips to Germany, I uh, was in a flea market and picked up a fashion magazine um, from East Germany. And this, and I opened it to the center and where we would normally think of as the centerfold of a fashion magazine, we're thinking of like the height of what's inaccessible. Um, in the center of this East German, fashion magazine were patterns for everything in the magazine. Um, so I became kind of like really enthralled with this idea of like, like what, is, what does it look like to want or, sh or show um, socialized products and how could I um, experiment with that? And so I started, I started collecting mail order catalogs from socialist countries, this one, is from the Soviet Union, specifically Estonia, um, from the early 60s. Um, this is a contrast. They're both from 1968. On the left is an East German mail order catalog page, and on the right is an American Spiegel catalog page. And I, again, like you can maybe see here why I was like interested in this like sort of hybrid illustration photography. I should say this says something like cooperation in the construction of socialism, a meaningful life for the modern woman. And like collecting these things sort of took me back to my own childhood. I didn't grow up with the internet. I got an email address like after I graduated college and I often think about being sort of the last uh, generation who can translate between to native tongues, like a non-digital and a digital tongue. And, um, you know, growing up with these things, this was how you got, uh, how you became a consumer at home. Um, and also looking at, like, uh, this is from the mid-20s, Russia. It's like a theater um, costume design um, book, um, Russian constructivism. This is Tatlin's uh, design for a man's leisure suit. Um, he, you know, this idea of like anti-fashion or practicality dictating your uh, apparel. Ruchenko and Stepanova, other constructivists. And also I was thinking a lot about clothing as prop um, or as like active agent within perform performing. Some other work that I was working on sort of before this, um, uh, these are sculptures called interiors, but like sort of my informal titles for them are on the left is pants and on the right are boot, boot one and boot two. This is another sculpture that preceded this work. Um, you know, just sort of thinking of merging the body or the subject with uh, the thing that contains it. This project is, is outfit is not my first commercial experiment. Um, I was commissioned by Art in General um, in their a former storefront space in um, Chinatown to uh, make a functioning uh, shop that was originally inspired by um, 
Klaus Oldenburg's The Store from 1961 that sold like sort of schlocky renditions of uh, sculptural renditions of everyday objects. But it also sort of like um, started me, my research into like what artist economies were and looked like and their histories, uh, obviously Warhol and the Factory, Gordon Matta Clark's Food, which was a functional restaurant in Soho in the 70s. Um, David Hammonds' uh, Snowball Sale um, in downtown New York. You guys like that one? That one's really inspiring. And uh, Keith Haring's Pop Shop uh, from the mid 80s. Um, so this is the interior of, of that project that I did called Company uh, and the exterior as well. And um, the project created kind of like all of these uh, collisions for me. Um, it was really awkward to position my artwork as like product, but it also was part of my research. Like what happens when we become consumers and like, and like how do the people I even know, how do they change and what, and how do I kind of make a fissure in that moment of, of being sort of an intellectual with agency to um, becoming a consumer um, being who, who's, who's in an environment desiring and coveting things. Um, and so practically it, it presented itself as a challenge because like people would come in, you know, and get in an argument with the salesperson because they wanted more you know, artwork than what they were, than their limited quota, or um, they would, you know, sort of break the rituals that were <laughs> sort of part of the project. Um, and those moments were like really problematic, but also very interesting to me. Um, and sort of like um, created, created in, in the work a life of its own. So, Originally, when, I, when we were first started talking about this um, residency and doing a lecture, and I was like, I really want to wait to share this project until I'm able to send out the mail order catalog and really get feedback and fulfill orders and actually like realize the whole exchange. And again, it's really interesting, some of the problems and dilemmas, but also like really kind of beautiful things that have come from it. Like, for example, um, you know, people receive the mail order catalog and they don't realize that they could actually order something. Like, you know, there's there's such a distance between the print media and and that being a method of shopping now that that even that was kind of like novel again. Um, uh, you know, a number of people saying that the prices were too high. Um, and then, you know, these are people who are like really thinking critically about the world we live in and, and you know, just having, then having discussions about like, what is the price of the things we wear? Like maybe it's not a monetary price, but like how are we paying for um, affordability um, in, in what we wear? And what does it really look like when we pay its worth in money? Um, and also struggling myself with like, this is what it costs to make this thing. Um, and then, um, you know, a lot of people asking, emailing me and asking me for clearer photos because they want to buy something, but the mail order catalog isn't providing the clear photo. And just like, you know, like what, what constitutes um, a, a system of trust in this, in a commercial exchange um, and, and, um, sort of challenging that and seeing how those behaviors have become um, so remote um, to experiment with and how to reactivate them. That's all really interesting to me. I think the, the most exciting thing has been um, receiving photos like this from people who have gotten <laughs> outfits and have felt like, have expressed to me that they feel um, this kind of like agency and somewhere between being like glamorous and also like they're ready to work in their studio, which really was the beginning impetus for me to inhabit the outfit myself. And that's been kind of like a really wonderful thing to find that 
my meaning in the work has um, expanded into other people's experiences. Um, so, uh, oh my God, I can't believe I'm gonna do this, but I'm not just a promoter of outfit, I'm also aware. <laughs> so, um, but I brought some for you, you know, if anybody uh, wants, and then I also brought some mail order catalogs of my own, as well as some archival mail order catalogs for my collection. Um, I just ask you to be obviously careful with them because they're um, some of them are fragile. So, thank you. Oh, I have to stay here for questions. So, if anyone has any <coughs> questions for Fong, we're going to open it up for a Q and A for uh, five ten minutes. It was just very, very um, striking to see the sweater with Ivanka Trump. Sorry, do you want to just start again? It was very striking to see the, the, photo, the photograph of the sweater and said, made in China. It was just very, very powerful to see that and, uh, and to have you be thinking about commodities and the political significance of them today. And I think there's a lot, it, it's a core, I think we artists could do a lot of political art around the Trump brand. Um, yeah, I mean, where do we even begin with our response to Trump as, <laughs> as, as representatives of agency? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right. Any other questions or? Oh, sure. That's cool. I'm just curious is uh, how is it selling a product? How do you strike a balance with offering a catalog that's also an artistic piece. Whereas when you were saying some people wish that the products were clearer photographs, I don't know, how do you make a balance on that when you're actually selling something? Well, um, how I'm thinking of it is my products are also artwork. So, and, and the exchange I'm thinking of as ex an experiment, and I guess another word is the exchange itself is an artwork. So even though um, there is a, a monetary exchange that's happening, I mean, I'm not making, I mean, I'm not, I'm, you know, this is like nothing. I can't live on this. This is about research and, um, and proposing another way to, um, consider these questions as we maybe activate um, less experimental uh, systems or machinery in our culture. So to me, the, you know, the reproduction not being clear is part of slowing down that process. So somebody might get frustrated and be like, I need to see another photo, but like, you know, then they have to have an exchange and in that exchange, I might say, well, here's another photo, but just, you know, you know, the, the economy is intended to be non-digital and, you know, how, you know, what, just to slow down that process. Do we have any more questions before we move on to the next artist? Uh, I guess uh, just seeing these in the evolution that it's come from, from your research to here in terms of moving forward and uh, the culmination of that research progressing into or evolving as the clothing line or your feedback might evolve, uh, you know, it has, has the feedback that you've been getting uh, and the responses and as your research grows, is that informing where, where this might be heading uh, as well as potentially, you know, the, the uh, data that you would get back uh, from you know from those designs and how they're used and how long they last and and kind yeah. of kind of that agency of ownership and and engagement with with not only a piece of of art but also a functional uh, a functional utility yeah it's a really good question because you know 
Um, God, I don't even know where to begin with that because there's a lot of questions in it. Um, I mean, simply put, it's funny what's happened in the evolution because I've become, I know whenever I get an order, I'm like, oh, I have to make another one. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm finding, I'm finding that the evolution of the project is, is less in the, the, the clothing and more in like almost that the possibility that somebody could come become a consumer, but but n almost like it rarely ever happening, and in those glimmer moments. Um, so I think you know I sort of developed this thinking that I would continue to make mail order catalogs just periodically, um, no like systematic you know calendar or whatever, but just whenever I felt like it. But I imagine it evolving into like an even more. Um, uh, sort of not not that this is incoherent, but a, but a more obscure um, format uh, w where buying something really means taking a risk and really not knowing. Thank you. Thank you. I Fawn. have one more question. Oh, one more question. Yeah. Where's, where's the, uh... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you guys have to wait Sorry. till the mic goes there. Since we're recording this, we have to, uh, we have a, rec a special mic for the, uh, okay. for the room. Thank you. I think this is a very fascinating topic that you're exploring. Thank you. And you're welcome. I was wondering how much consideration you gave to, to the, um, a body image, the body image of, of the model, because it's had such an impact on women, what models look like and how clothes portray or sexualize, objectify a female body. I was just wondering what your take on that is. Yeah. Um, well, again, there's a number of questions in that because one thing I found, of course, is as much as I want these designs to be compatible with everybody's body, that hasn't always been the case. And I. I I will recreate and modify, you know, free of charge, any size, you know, and I really try to be like as supportive of different bodies in that respect as I can be, but I'm frustrated myself that I can't, it's not possible to make something that will fit everybody at once. Um, and, um, but in terms of um, thinking specifically about women's bodies, of course, this is, um, and, and the politics around how we frame them, how we perceive them, how it feels to be in one, um, is uh, like a really, you know, it's a lifetime of work. Um, I think with this project, I um, was thinking about how I know um, I become the least self-conscious of my body um, to work, to really work. You know, and it's 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 when things aren't tight. It's when things have pockets that can hold everything. I don't have to schlep around bags. But more important, like when, um, I those those baggy characteristics don't dismantle my own ex my own gender experience, where they su still support it, and um, I. I still um, feel like I'm inhabiting my particular experience of, of being a female and having a female body. Do we have any more questions? Thanks, guys. Okay, so. Um, Thank you, Fawn. That was uh, illuminating and definitely fleshed out a lot of the conversations we had um, while we were making your, your beautiful catalog. Um, so next up, we have uh, Harvey Redding. Um, Harvey Redding's art and design work has been shown at the Yale University Library, the Center uh, George Pompidou, the Cooper Union, uh, Leslie, the Leslie Lohman Gay and uh, Lesbian Art Museum's project space, and it's in the collection. It's and um, his work is in the collection of the uh, Librairie 
National in Paris, the Austrian Museum of Applied Arts um, in Vienna, and the New York City Public Library in New York. Um, his design and curatorial credits range from Barbie Doll's 30th Pink Jubilee birthday party fashion retrospective at Lincoln Center for Mattel Toys and a traveling museum for Hasbro's G.I. Joe action figure. So we got some amazing contrast and uh, comparisons there. Um, to the history-making photography retrospective Berlin on Berlin for le the legendary gay sex icon uh, Peter Berlin. Publishing credits include Purgatory Pie Press and Bruno Gmunder. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Harvey Redding. So, I have a lot of friends here. It's very sweet that you've all come. Um, so, um, this is my first, well actually this is my second piece of artwork that I did. Some of you may know of the Gaiety Theater. Um, anybody here remember the Gaiety? Yeah? yeah? Um, this is my first attempt using the uh, Riso printing machine. And I wanted to experiment a little bit about color and how to use it. This was a, me kind of working out all the issues about print. Um, and um, maybe I should say a few words about the Gaiety Theater. This was a um, kind of odd burlesque hall in Times Square above the Howard Johnsons. And it was kind of an odd place that you would go to see dancers who would, believe it or not, have to dance with an erection. And, uh, <laughs> Um, and the place was above the Howard Johnsons, um, but it became kind of legendary when Madonna did a photo shoot there. Anyway, this is my, I think, first successful print. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the color process. Um, I decided to move on from um, and not use my drawing skills, but to do more collage work. And I did this series of nine prints um, having to do with um, the, um, really the pain of my childhood being in the closet. And um, so I did this series called, um, actually I don't really have a name for it, but it's about kind of a hidden identity uh, of being a gay man or a gay boy. And I found a kind of odd little ad in Popular Mechanics, I think for an insurance company. So I combined it with some of um, really kind of hilarious uh, derogatory terms for gay men. Um, I don't know whether you've heard the term donut puncher before. <laughs> um, but they're slightly humorous, but um, kind of oddly painful at the same time. This is another piece I did. And these colors are a little bit distorted because of the light in here, I think. But um, you know, this, this printing process has the most glorious colors. And I know it's a little hard to understand what this press is like. Um, Pan mentioned it kind of looks like a copy machine, uh, a slightly bloated copy machine, but it's actually an automated silkscreen machine. And it prints very, very quickly. And it prints in extremely bright, appealing colors that are almost like candy. Um, the colors are so absolutely radiant. And, well, this is another print of the same series. Another horrifying derogatory term, which is funny, but not so funny, I guess. Another ridiculous term, which I've never heard before. <laughs> A gay man from Oklahoma, I guess. It's another piece. 
and of course, friend of Dorothy. So this was my experiments finding out how these colors interact with each other. There's about a 20, maybe 25% uh, translucent quality to the inks. Um, so you get these really wonderful combinations of colors. So I'm going to back track a little bit in my life um, and then get back to the print work I did uh, here at SVA. Um, you know, when I moved to New York, I, I got a job as a, um, a waiter and a kitchen porter at a restaurant in Soho, which um, after a year and a half was, um, I was just over it. Anyway, I decided that I would begin making a living as an artist um, that week, and I would just figure out something. So I started making these postcards with collage and selling them at a store called Fiorucci. Um, and I actually made a living for several years doing that. But this is my first uh, print work. And this was in the late uh, 70s, early 80s, when the Xerox company came out with a color printer, which looks basically like the Riso printer looks. So I'll show you a few of these. These are some of the pieces I did. I actually made a living for a couple of years doing this. Um, and these were all done before digital anything. They were done with the scissors and um, uh, glue <laughs> and all those things we used to use. There's another one. One more. Very gay, don't you think? <laughs> Maybe that should be my Christmas card. Little stigmata Elvis. I guess you can't really tell because of the color here, but the, um, the Xerox uh, color copier only had three colors. There was no black. And uh, you would get these really strange color combinations. Um, this was a little comment on religious America. That was a popular one. Back in the fashion world. <laughs> This looks very similar to some of the later stuff I'll show you. Anyway, um, early on there was a couple um, who were uh, uh, students at Beloit College who saw my postcards, the ones I, I just showed you, um, in a store in Chicago. And um, when, they, when, I, when they moved to New York, they contacted me and they were starting a printing, uh, a fine art printing press um, called Purgatory, Purgatory Pie Press. And it was a couple named Dicko Faust and Esther K. Smith. And they asked me to start producing postcards with them. So this is my second um, journey into printmaking using a letterpress. And this was the first piece we did together. This was the second. And you know, I, I'm still working with this, these, these people. Um, Dicko actually teaches here at SVA. And their master printer is Esther is one of the great art directors ever, even though she's, she can be a little difficult. Uh, Dicko is, is a master printer and a genius at printmaking. But these were all letterpress. And the color was done actually with linoleum, a hand cut linoleum blocks, and then all hand printed by Dicko. And this was the first of a series that was meant to hold up to the light and then you would see a surprise something there. The orange turns into a little globe. This was the second piece I did with them, which was kind of a funny little drawing that you would hold up to the light. And this cute little cherub appears. And then for Easter, you hold it up to the light. And the, um, Baby chicken appears. Um, that was a series. Was actually a, a postcard of the month club that that Dick and Esther did. Um, we moved on and started doing triptychs together. This is a piece I did on the subway. Um, 
they used to have the Miss Subway competition where they would, there'd be a young, glamorous female who would be Miss Subway for the year, I think. And so I was just kind of playing on the ridiculous idea about that. This was, um, I've always loved the, the mosaics in the subway. And then this was a fold-out piece. So it opened up and, and you saw the subway train. This was um, something Esther talked me into doing. She, I think she was making fun of me for being a gay man. Uh, called the Harvey's House of Beauty. And you would pull the shade up and there I magically appear with all my wonderful beauty products, shampoos and hair conditioners and things. And then the other side had this on, which you could play with. And inside were um, quotes by famous um, women and uh, fake advertisements that I made up about the products. There's another one. Gaiety Curl, one of my favorite products. And a funny quote by Jane Fonda. Anyway, this, uh, this was the work I, um, that I did that inspired the work I did here at SVA. This is a show I had last April. And you know, I started fooling around with um, windows. I think I was trying to remember um, my childhood, and um, as, a, as a gay kid, always having to um, look, I always felt I was looking into, an, I, like I wasn't really living my life, but I was, I was trying to um, grab pieces, trying to find out who I was through um, other worlds, windows or uh, open doors or things it became kind of a symbol. Anyway, I started trying to think of what my thoughts were like when I was young and this kind of emerged and really became the format for the show and also all the work that I did here. This is another piece from the show. A little plan fashion. And this was another window piece. Um, I actually ended up making about 100 of these. Um, I've always loved Baroque stage settings and, and, and toys and um, little paper fold out things and, um, and tried to continue with the idea of looking through windows as a kind of peeping Tom. This is one of the early pieces as well. And you know, I used mainly Popular Mechanics magazines and uh, scanned them and printed them in different ways and um, printed them over painted pieces and cut out the figures. And these are all, um, the figures are all from a, a really kind of tacky and slightly sordid um, bodybuilding magazine. There's a detail, and there's a neighbor looking out the window. And as I said, I, you know, I've always loved little toy theaters, so I did quite a few pieces um, that had curtains and kind of theatrical things, and uh, I used a French dictionary for um, some of the furniture and the figure came from a kind of odd little advertisement for a, a weight reducing harness, I think. This is a, a portrait I did of, of the early um, silent film star, Ramon Navarro, who was uh, murdered by two um, uh, prostitutes that he had hired. And um, I used pieces uh, from a, a catalog for, um, what's the toy, an erector set, um, to kind of shield and cover his face, and just to continue with the idea of uh, hiddenness and looking into 
um, windows or through picture frames, trying to, um, as a kid, trying to put together my own life by stealing bits and pieces from different worlds. This is another piece that I used a French dictionary for, also kind of a peekaboo piece. And I did a series of, of mirrors of images. It's another apartment building with kind of, I guess the names were from, um, uh, also from a bodybuilding magazine. There's a detail. Another one. This was a large construction that I did using my uh, black and white um, copier, my desk printer, uh, but printing on uh, color pages or color sheets that I, I rolled different colors on. There's a detail with his mom looking out the window behind what looks like me as a child. This is a close up. Another one. So, um, I was very lucky to get a chance to work um, here this summer with this fabulous machine. Um, this was the print slam where we showed pieces um, at the end of the, um, the summer and um, I thought of this kind of cute, corny name for what I was about to uh, show. This is my living room with the pieces um, set up for the first time. Now, there, there are actually about 800 pieces um, to this. It's a sculpture, I guess. Um, and I haven't put the whole thing together yet. This is a little section here, but it's quite massive. And it's, um, it's uh, still growing, so we'll see how, how big it actually gets. This is here, uh, the night of the Prince Slam, when I set it up for the first time. This is my living room with my exact replica of the Parthenon in the distance. There you can see some of the windows and some of the figures. It's another close-up. It's just fun to peek through windows and see what's happening. You know, I started printing. I, I really tried hard to um, uh, uh, do a really exact uh, uh, color registration and. I, you know, I had to use very heavy paper. I used 100 pound um, Bristol, and the machine would just not take it through consistently. So I abandoned all my plans and decided I would just handle it very painterly. And um, I used, you know, with the machines you can you can uh, use digital files, or you can actually use black and white originals on top as you would a regular copy machine. So I chose that and it was much more playful for me. I could experiment with the colors. And as I said, the colors have this really, not only vibrant color, but the, the translucent quality really gives you a lot of play with colors and printing on top of each other. Now, you know, these, these machines are, it's, they're kind of odd. They're, um, they're definitely high tech, but they, you know, you feel like you're working with a giant toy. It's like a kid's printing press in a way. It's, it's, it's very um, high tech, but very clumsy in a funny way too. But it's, it's, um, it just has a lot of possibilities for any artist working. You just start thinking about clever ways to use it and to use the colors on top of each other. And after a while, it becomes quite fluid as you begin to use, learn to use the machine. Um, and it prints very, very quickly. It prints two colors at once, and you can take the drums out and replace them with other colors. So in a two-hour session, if you use it very playfully, you can come up with quite a lot of really interesting color combinations. 
There's a little close-up. It looks like me as a child. I'll move through these quickly as we show some details. A little bathroom scene. Um, I like lyrics from old songs. This is from uh, a Supremes song. Another image from an old bodybuilding magazine. That's something going wrong with the toilet, I think. <laughs> There's a close-up of one of the um, interior pictures. Another one. As you see, I went wild printing these things. It was really a wonderful, playful experience. It became like a painting after a while. I'm almost through. There's my cranky next door neighbor who happens to look like a Leonardo da Vinci painting. Um, you know, I used a lot of type, that's actually a quote from, um, not William Blake, from uh, Walt Whitman. And for the first time I'll be showing the entire piece. Um, as I said, it's quite massive, it's going to fill the entire room. Um, I'll be showing it at the uh, Leslie Lohman Gay Art Museum's Prince Street project space in February. So um, I've never seen the whole thing up, but, and nobody else has as well. Um, so I'll be sending out invitations, so hopefully all of you will come. And that's it. So, questions, comments? Harvey, the different colors on these prints, is it all printed at the same time, or do you print one set, say, uh, the reds, and then you do yellows and blues, or, or does it, like if you go to a regular printer, a print shop, uh, you have a photograph or something, mm -hmm. a piece of work, you put it on the thing and you print it and it mm -hmm. comes out. But this looks a little different. I mean, do you well, yeah, it's kind of odd. It prints two colors at once. It's actually got two ink drums. And the other ink drums are all in cases that look like little dog-carrying cases. And it, it'll print, depending on the order of the colors you're printing, it'll print uh, slightly differently. But it prints two colors at once, and then you can put two other drums in and print two more colors. You can keep going forever, actually. Most of the things I did were three colors. I would print two colors the first run and go back and print a third on top of it, a darker, like the lines would be printed last. As I said, it's kind of an odd printing machine, really, and it's like a big toy. It's like, uh, I mean, if you remember having, being a kid and having, you know, like a give a show projector or an easy bake oven or Barbie's 
Malibu Dream House. It's kind of an odd big toy that prints very quickly, and you, especially books and zines and things like that, you can print uh, massive amounts, um, and you can do big runs quickly, you know, just print, you know, and you can adjust the speed. So it's a, it's a fabulous high-tech printing process that feels like a childhood toy, if that explains it at all. Do you, have you got complete control over your color? Do you buy printing inks in colors that you, you just have to buy what they have? Well, the colors are, depending on what, I mean, Pan's the head of the department, the, uh, the lab, and um, depending on what colors he chooses to have around, I think there were 12, 13 colors, something like that? We have, right now we have eight colors. Eight colors. So essentially the way it works is, um, you know, for every color you want to print, there's a, there's a, you know, cylinder, a drum that's dedicated to that color because it's stained with that ink. And if you want to, you know, so you would, so that's dedicated to printing green or orange or what have you, but it prints with a... Is it a CMYK type? Um, we, we, well, you can, you can do a version of CMYK, um, but we're substituting other kinds of, you know, like a pure blue. So it's, it's always going to be an approximation, but we're definitely, you know, developing versions of CMYK. That's the difference. You're printing with, you know, pure green, not a composite of yellow and cyan. Yeah. I also want to say that, you know, when we had this print slam, which was the evening, I mean, there's another one on Monday, but when the end of the summer, we, you know, all the students, the grad students uh, showed their work and there were hundreds of pieces, but they were all absolutely phenomenal looking. Everybody had the most amazing looking, whatever they did. So it's a fabulous device, um, a vehicle for, you know, a very playful thing like I did, or, you know, a very subversive zine that somebody might be producing, but it's a, it's a great tool. Is it limited in size that you can print? I mean, the paper size. Is it like, I see yeah, you got different as, sizes As a there. copy machine is, it prints in up to 11 by 17. So it's, yeah, it prints sizes like a copy machine does. Do we have any more questions? Harvey, um, you mentioned your cranky next door neighbor. <laughs> I was wondering which which of your next door neighbors you were referencing. <laughs> that question comes from my actual next door neighbor, <laughs> Linda Donald. Uh, no, nothing, nothing offensive, Linda. I adore you. No, she's a dream next door neighbor. I was wondering why everyone was alone in their own window and there was never more than one person. Oh. I guess I, because most of them were bathroom scenes. <laughs> um, I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. There are a couple of couples, you know, fashion magazine illustrations. Um, I don't know. You've, uh, you've seen something. You dig into my... Psyche somehow, right? Any other questions? How do you control the registration? Well, you know, you, you can uh, you can control the registration. I you know I was using very heavy stock, so it it uh, it threw everything off. The the feeder was taking it in at different speeds. And I needed a heavy paper stock to do the kind of folding that I was going to be doing to, so the thing would stand up. So I just had to abandon that. So the registrations were, were off always for me. So I just had to use, utilize that and make that work for myself. Um, and I needed the heavy stock because this thing is actually, the, when I get the whole thing set up, it's quite tall. It's six feet high. Um, so um, I needed that. But yeah, it, you can get... Very nice registration if you're doing a book, illustration for a book or something like that, but I had to give up. Thanks, Harvey.
You're welcome. Our final artist in residence for tonight. And as you can see, I mean, there's a whole, there's a huge range of, of, of work that you can, that can be produced with these machines. Um, the technology is neutral. Uh, you we're just, you know, you're just pushing ink through a screen, through a stencil that's attached, that's wrapped around a drum. Um, and I think, I think the, you know, already the, the two different, uh, the contrast between Fawn's work and Harvey's work, you see, you know, the huge, the huge uh, range of sort of possibilities. Um, so our final artist in residence tonight is uh, Tu Tran. Tu Tran is a visual artist based in New York and an animator for Super Deluxe. She makes videos, installations, video games, and comics. She was co-creator and host of, psychedelic, of the psychedelic television cooking series Food Party for IFC and Late Night Munchies for MTV, which um, if you don't know, uh, if you haven't seen Food Party, I would recommend looking it up on YouTube. There's a lot of uh, um, quite insane and amazing um, uh, back episodes that are, that are online. Um, she has held residencies at the Clock Tower Gallery, the Ace Hotel, um, Bemis Center, uh, Spaces Cleveland, and Art Farm Nebraska. Her installations at the Museum of Moving Images, Mutant Leftovers, was called, quote, gross but mesmerizing by the Creators Project. A collaboration uh, of Baby Castle, a collaborator of Baby Castle, she has helped produce game installations and workshops, including Meow Town, a cat town, at Le Gate Lyrique in Paris, and Cyborg Workshop at Worm Rotterdam. Her latest games are in collaboration with Ivan Safran and Bobo Du, um, Cleveland Games, Pasta Shooter, and Hellmouth. Um, please give a round of applause for Tu Tren. Thanks, Pan, um, and Rizzo Lab, and all you guys. Um, I had a lot of fun this summer. Uh, it did feel like a like a really amazing Rizzo summer vacation because like every time I came in, I just like, oh, what do I print today? And I did just kind of treat it like um, I'm just gonna have a lot of fun printing as much as possible. And I, I wound up um, kind of like during my residency, um, I did, uh, my hope was to work on a comic book from start to finish, um, but like I just spent like most of the time writing and then um, uh, during the uh, printing time, I would just kind of like um, just print whatever I could. Um, so uh, these are some images um, that uh, I just kind of started to play with like during, um, I took a Rizzo class earlier in the year um, with uh, Patrick. Uh, it was like a mini comics class. And uh, my goal for taking that class was, um, uh, for most of my work, I've done like a lot of like uh, live action video uh, work before that. And I've kind of just started doing more like, um, like 3D animation and uh, kind of like designing assets for games and stuff like that. But um, uh, for the most part, like my drawing skills were like not very strong and I wanted to like, figure out or at least like learn how to finish drawings or make drawings that looked finished. Um, uh, just because like prior to that, like drawing has mainly been more of like a means to an end, uh, just mainly doing sketching and really like kind of sloppy uh, storyboarding. Uh, these prints are just food prints. Uh, uh, this drawing series I made, uh, it's actually uh, in collaboration with uh, my friend Sandra. Um, I just draw all these like food. I kind of just kind of drew these more like random food asset type things and then just kind of collaging them randomly together to make these prints. Um, and I uh, just experiment it with different colors. I can print them in. Uh, most of them are uh, three, three colors or so. Um, and this is uh, some earlier stuff, uh, just like some drawings. Um, these are the drawings I did with my friend Sandra. Uh, she draws these girl heads um, and then like I just try to, I guess, like turn uh, my other stuff into uh, the clothes for it. Um, this is like what her work looks like. She's a really amazing illustrator as well. And her, I've always kind of like looked up to her um, and uh, just like in the way that like she like, um, I don't know, uh, we were close friends uh, only because um, we, she's like my only friend who will go out and eat intestines with me or like pig feet or uh, just like those like, um, the kind of Asian foods that scare uh, a lot of Americans. Um, so uh, we made the zine together. Um, they're just, um, 
I'll just kind of share some spreads here. And they're, they're just, I don't know, we just kind of had fun, um, just like drawing stuff. And for us, like these, these are just the kind of drawings that we make almost automatically without thinking twice about it, you know? Like she just kind of tends to draw certain things and I do as well. Um, so these are kind of the prints that we made for that. Um, another project I worked with on for another couple of weeks was uh, these photos. Uh, these photos was a, they were, a, this was a failed project uh, from a couple years ago. Um, I made these uh, with the intention of replacing the artwork in my mother's salon in Cleveland, because uh, like, she kind of got into um, finding all my old artwork from high school and stuff, like all the bad still lives and figure paintings you make when you're in art school. She just started hanging them up in her salon, you know, and it just like mortified me every time I went there uh, to like look at, uh, you know, like your dark past. Um, so uh, I just uh, um, wanted to like make nice photos for her. So. Um, I uh, like staged like this whole like it was like a whole production like I had a photographer, nail artist, uh, two hand models, um, and uh, we I set up like this like uh, thing in my apartment and uh, we spent like a whole evening just like shooting all these photos and I had a friend who worked uh, at Box who like pr uh, they print uh, photos for Annie Leibovitz you know so these are going to be like really nice you know I was going to hook my mom up and I was like really excited about them um, and I thought the photos were they're kind of like whatever but um, they, uh, and then when I printed them, uh, uh, or my, my friend photo prints them, she, I gave them to my mom and she was just kind of like, uh, you want me to hang these up in my salon? Because her criticism was, um, I didn't Photoshop these, these are just like straight out of the camera and printed. Um, and a lot of the posters in her salon, they would be more uh, airbrushed or uh, glamorous. Uh, so I was like, oh, maybe I could try Rizzo printing these, because you, that, you know, like it, uh, you lose all that hyper real detail with a photo and it kind of like looks cooler. And actually, um, I was really happy with these prints. Uh, they looked really cool. Um, I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> I guess it's hard. Um, I printed these uh, CMY uh, with, no, with no black in. Uh, th so all the red, the red channel is all hot pink and it changed the colors to make it look really cool. Um, and she was, uh, I gave them to her and she was, slightly less, um, <laughs> she liked them a little bit more, but like not enough to hang them up in her salon yet. Uh, but the, the one that she actually liked was this one. So I think uh, I just kind of have to take a whole nother direction uh, with these um, was cause like she just, I, I just did these this really quickly too. It's like, oh, I'll just trace one of these photos and see if she likes this graphic one. And sure enough, she's like, I like this one the most, but you did such a bad job drawing it, you know? And I go, yeah, you're right. I'll <laughs> I'll do a better job next time. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, that's what that is. So that's one of the projects I worked on. Um, this I'm just sharing. Uh, I did this for uh, like as a demo uh, for a workshop where it was a pretty simple uh, figure drawing uh, and Rizzo printing. Um, so I just kind of like used this Botero painting that I really liked and made a drawing. And then these are the channels, the two different uh, color layers I made. Um, and I think uh, I was just kind of like interested in not coloring on a computer uh, like I was with the other prints. I wanted to color stuff by hand and to see, because I really like how it prints. I really like how Rizzo prints pencil, how it still looks like pencil. So I um, printed this in a couple different colors and I like it, so that's that. Uh, this is just like another drawing experiment. Um, this was what I ate the past two years. Um, you know how people take photos of their food a lot? Um, I have, I've had that habit since um, a long time ago, but, um, but f I don't take, I don't, when I take photos of what I'm eating, it's just like it, it has to be, like, you can't really, you have to do it kind of discreetly because you don't want your friends to make fun of you. So a lot of times it'll be, like, mid or, like, I'm by myself, you know, and, like, I didn't really do a good, I mean, like, I, doing this, like, uh, just kind of recording this uh, more personally, um, it just kind of made me realize how many different kinds of spaghetti I ate. Um, but the, um, uh, this, uh, oh, yeah, I was showing this one because uh, this is some stuff I worked on last year to kind of give you more context. Um, this is uh, this was actually for a video installation piece I made for uh, the 
the Museum of Moving Images, uh, and I just kind of turned, collaged all my, like, um, basically all the food that I cooked for myself, and a lot of times it's not pretty, um, and I tried to turn that into like a really beautiful ocean, um, and uh, I thought it came out pretty cool. Um, this one, uh, this was for Hellmouth. Uh, this was the concept art I made for it, and uh, the Hellmouth is a cooking game that takes place in hell, and there's like these two um, weird demon creatures who, um, it's a two-player game, you fight head-to-head -head, uh, in a battle course where you hunt for ingredients to cook food for Satan, and uh, at the end, like, he judges what you're eating, and he goes, oh, he gives you, either gives you a thumbs up or a thumbs down, but in the beginning of the game, he prompts you, like, make me a salad, or, like, I want uh, dessert, or he'll kind of prompt you with, like, what he wants to eat, and the goal is to run around the course and find the ingredients you need to, to cook the thing. So it's all 3D. Um, but what was cool about this was um, we, we used my uh, painted textures because uh, um, we worked with the 3D artist and um, a programmer. And he just kind of like, it was really cool how he turned the drawings into 3D. This is fighting over a crab. And you can fight each other too. Like you can like steal food. It's pretty fun. One day we'll finish the game. Um, <laughs> so these are some of the assets I drew for it. Um, and I found out that I really just like drawing assets. It's like really fun to just like draw everything you need in the game, um, just like on one page. It's like really fun. Um, these are two books that were like really inspiring to me when I made this other book. Um, what I really like about um, the Codex Seraphim, I don't even know how to say that, Seraphimian is. I never had to say it out loud. Um, the, um, I really like how everything just like is super made up, uh, even the language, um, and uh, I just kind of like, it's just kind of cool to see, just kind of like uh, imagination. I know it always comes from somewhere, but it, it's kind of cool to like not really know where as well, like how mysterious that is. Um, so I made this book a while ago, which I thought was like okay, and I actually, um, I made this before I knew what Rizzo was, but like I made it after I saw something that was Rizograph, but I didn't know, I didn't know that it was called Rizograph or what it was. I just like picked up a comic book. Um, I picked up a comic book uh, that had blue lines. This is like why I designed it this way. Um, was uh, I just uh, saw this comic book that I thought looked cool. So I made this book uh, at this residency and uh, I made it pretty quickly too, and it was printed uh, newsprint, uh, an inkjet printer, and the guy at the residency was really amazing because we had similar bootlegging qualities that we really liked. Like he just like had this normal consumer uh, inkjet printer that he would hook up bottles of ink into with like the tubes and stuff. It was like really, and it was just like a way for artists to make books, you know, but it was like very like um, uh, bootlegged, but that was how I printed this book and I only made like 20. Then I ran out, I was like, oh, I can do that again. So this time I wanted to hand color it um, and I just, just did this landscape as a study, but then it turned into the cover of the book as well because uh, what was lacking in these other ones was like, um, like I just kind of like going back, it's like, oh, I would fix the lettering and like they all need backgrounds. You don't know where they are and there's a lot of wasted space uh, and all that stuff. So um, I'm just going to share the whole book with you guys. Um, I won't have to, I won't read it. It'll, it'll just kind of go through it. Um, but what was funny about some of these captions is um, uh, it's, it's, it's a really um, organic book. Like I, for, e for each page, I just kind of just like look at it and just kind of write down what I'm thinking when I look at it, you know, just kind of like the way someone might be exploring in the woods, you know, and then like, oh, I see a kangaroo. It has three ears. Um, oh, this creature startled me. Do, do, did it startle you? I thought it was one of the trees in the woods. Then it revealed its eyes to me. Its eyes are like a big boom pies. How did I mistake you? So, I don't know, it's like pretty playful. And 
we're all kind of in the same place, but not. And it's just supposed to feel like you're walking around somewhere. And then there's a surprise ending. And that's it. Um, that ends my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? On that Rizal machine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were. Uh, it was three. It was a uh, pink, fluorescent pink, uh, yellow, and blue. And uh, I just used the the pre-existing CMYK channels. I just didn't use the black one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the channels, right? So I just printed each channel as like a different. As a as a separate ink color. Do I have a question? Um, what do you see the, you know, what's the um, connecting? You know, what connects all the different things you do? Because you work in different mediums. I really don't know, Pan. <laughs> I really like. I feel like um, um, I don't think. I don't think long term. I think that's the big problem. Like I always think about, oh, this is fun right now. I'm going to do this. Um, one day I hope to find a way to, um, so or at so least like find the thread. So do you do you do you uh, work intuitively? Like just kind of yeah. follow your gut? Yeah, I definitely like follow. Like if it doesn't, um, I definitely follow my gut a lot um, to like a fault. But it's it's, it's I don't know. It, I I just always feel like I just do whatever I feel like doing. Are there any more questions? All right, well, uh, thank you guys all for coming out tonight. Um, uh, we, uh, as we said before, um, uh, we're going to have the print slam on Monday, so you can check out what, um, what our students did this semester, including students from our brand new undergrad class, which I was really excited to teach this semester, um, and have kind of challenged my students with some with some uh, different concepts and sort of thinking about technology and art. Um, uh, and also, we're, uh, we have uh, course registration um, pamphlets uh, up at this table over here and all kinds of other uh, work. Some of our artists and residents have brought work you can check out. Um, uh, and if you have any questions, um, you, know, you, can, you can speak to me or um, attend our info session on January 11th. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, let's give a round of applause for all our artists and residents. <laughs>
So, um, but in the past decade or so, artists have kind of discovered them and put them to use in all kinds of print and publishing experiments. Um, this is a phenomenon that's occurred parallel to the massive rebirth of self-publishing and zine culture, which, uh, which is sort of uh, a, a response to, but also Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you guys for coming, especially for braving such a, such a, a warm and festive uh, winter evening. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, I would like to uh, welcome you guys. Uh, my name is Nathan Fox. Uh, I'm the chair of the MFA Visual Narrative Program uh, here at SVA. Uh, it's a low residency uh, graduate program in visual storytelling uh, that places emphasis on both creative writing uh, and visual art equally. Uh, and uh, it is my supreme pleasure uh, to have you guys here, uh, especially this evening with our artists in residence, as this is our kind of inaugural year in total. We launched, uh, Pan and I launched the uh, Rezo Lab uh, just a bit over a year ago. Uh, our artists in residence, this is our first launch uh, of this, and I'm, I'm really proud to uh, have them here and be able to continue this program. So thank you guys very much. Um, the, the program that I run is based in storytelling. So self-publishing and original content is massive. Uh, so for us to be able to provide, offer, and even just generate uh, the Rezo Lab uh, that drew these artists and, and others to it, to begin with, is phenomenal. Uh, and I, I couldn't have done that uh, without Pan. And uh, we ended up meeting uh, again about a, about a year ago uh, and uh, really got together and tried to push to bring something unique that the school didn't have that would really emphasize uh, that, that sense of agency, authorship, uh, and publishing. Uh, and Pan, uh, as you guys will meet in a second, uh, Paniotis Terzis is an amazing printmaker, uh, easily a master uh, Rizzo Smith, uh, and an artist in his own right. Um, so without further de delay, I'd like to introduce uh, Pan Terzis. So I'm um, connected to all kinds of um, subcultures uh, sort of exploding out of the internet and all kinds of different people finding each other. So these are two parallel um, phenomenons that have happened. This has created a, created a space where uh, artists and photographers, creative people from all kinds of different backgrounds, designers, um, converge and, and share ideas uh, in various print, uh, print projects. Um, at the lab, essentially, we're dedicated to providing an inter interdisciplinary space for printing, publishing, and production of resograph-based printed works. Our mission is to become a hub of small-scale and experimental printing um, and publishing activity that brings together artists of all backgrounds and disciplines to encourage dialogue across different creative worlds and foster discussion about the role of print media as a vehicle for art and culture and as a way to work out creative ideas that lead to unexpected results that would not be possible without the sole reliance on today's digital tools. Um, so here you see there's a few scenes. This is one of our other current artists in residence, Greg Foley with a workshop that he recently, le recently led where we opened up our space to the public um, to come in and, and sort of test out these machines. As you can see, um, that's the Rezo. Um, you know, they look like just traditional copy machines, um, but they're really these kind of amazing, incredible machines um, that sort of force, uh, you know, force the artists to really get involved in the, in, the, in the process. And we've done all kinds of collaborations with different departments, including um, the Department of uh, the International Studies Program. So this is a workshop that we led over the summer with a group of students from China, uh, Korea, and a few students from Japan. Um, so at the end of the spring semester of 2016, we added our artist in residence program to um, you know our growing list of collaborations with other departments and all kinds of endeavors. Um, as a chance to open up the lab for individuals with a unique vision to come into the space, learn the process, and develop a print-based project incorporating Rezo printing and elements of self-publishing. And tonight you're going to get a chance to hear from three of our artists and residents, um, Fawn Krieger, uh, Harvey Redding, and uh, Tutran. Um, I also want to mention that we have an event that we've been, um, we've been running every semester at the end of, at the conclusion of the semester where uh, 
we give our students a chance to uh, sell the work that they've made, um, exhibit it, um, you know, trade. Uh, so we're gonna have the, our fourth uh, semi-annual print slam on, on Monday. And uh, this Monday, it's gonna be from five o'clock to eight o'clock. Um, so, you know, if, if, uh, if anyone wants to come out and see in person some of the work that's been, that's been made this semester in the lab, um, uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to have you there. Um, additionally, we'll be having an, an information session on January uh, 11th, uh, that's a Wednesday, um, where you'll be able to get a chance to come out and hear from all of us individually, um, the three, four faculty members uh, from the Brizo Lab, and also you'll, you'll get to test out the machines and kind of see what it's all about. Um, so before we start tonight, I want to leave you with a few, just a few ideas to think about that, that I think are really, uh, the two kind of themes that are closely connected to, uh, to sort of using risograph printing to, to, create, uh, to create artworks and publications. Um, this process requires you to become deeply involved in the process by separating colors and controlling the speed, pressure, and the, pos and the position of the drums um, during print runs, uh, connecting, which connects this process with the history of artists using technology um, to make all kinds of new, new, new uh, sort of uh, kinds of work, different sort of artworks. Um, so what we're doing, essentially, uh, by taking these machines that weren't designed um, to, to create you know, multi-layer prints, um, you know, we're joining the tradition of, of artists such as Robert Rauschenberg, Gretchen Bender, um, uh, Nam, Nam June Paik, uh, who have taken technology and sort of used that to change their work and change the process and ultimately change the message um, of the work that they're creating. It's the, this, the collaboration between man and machine, which is something that I, th I don't think you can separate when you work with a machine, a technology like Rizzo. The other theme that I want you guys to think about as you, as you, uh, as you see what our artists and residents have, have come up with during their time here is um, that risograph printing taps into the possibilities that printing technologies have always provided, the power to develop and express a unique point of view and to spread a message, spread that message throughout society. Um, this kind of activity is healthy, is crucial for a healthy civil society to flourish in a democracy and it's I think it's more important than ever as our core democratic values come increasingly under threat. Um, so here at the Rizzo Lab, we're committed to absolute freedom of expression and providing a space for aesthetic, technological, and conceptual experiments in art and print. Um, so I'm gonna introduce our first artist in residence, Fawn Krieger, who, uh, Fawn Krieger is a New York-based artist whose multi-genre works examine themes of touch, ownership, and exchange. She received her BFA from Parsons School of Design and her MFA from Bard College's Milton Avery Graduate School of the Arts. Uh, her work has been exhibited at the Kitchen, Art in General, Nice and Fit Gallery, the Moore Space, Von Lintel Gallery, the Rose Art Museum at, at Brandeis University, and many, many more. Um, it's been, she's been featured in New York Times, uh, Art Forum, Art in America, Sculpture Magazine, New York Arts, Flash Arts, and Text zur Kunst. Um, Fons received numerous grants, 